This is a simple demonstration about how we can model radioactive decay using dice. So in this case we start with a pack of 72 dice and shuffle them up in a container and then tip them out. Now there are six faces on the dice so we're going to choose the one that shows with the upper side with the six dots and we'll say that one has decayed. So there should be one in six should decay. Now if you've got 72 dice that's about 12 should decay. So in this case here you can see the students have taken out all the ones with the six facing upwards and that comes to about 14. So they've, they've pulled out 14 dice that have decayed. That leaves 58 behind. So they're going to do it again. This time it should be one sixth of the 58, about nine or so. And you can see them counting them out with the six uppermost, so they've decayed. And it looks like they're going to get about eight or nine. Yes, they've got nine there. So they'll repeat that. That leaves 49 dice to put back in the container, they'll shuffle that up and continue on. And it just happens, they'll keep doing this for at least a half a dozen throws. We'll see what they get for this one. Looks like it should be about eight dice. Yes, they've got eight. So that leaves 41 behind. Okay, so for the next, next throw, I'll just keep on going. Now I'll just take a shortcut here and we'll go to the end part where they're down to just a few dice. Now in this video I'm going to plot some of the data we got from the dice throwing experiment. So here's a new lot of data and you can see here's the number of throws in the first column. Now I took it a bit further, I went up to 19 throws rather than stopping at 5 or 6. Here's the number that decayed each throw. So in the first throw, 17 were six facing up. So I got rid of those as decay and then continued on. And then we did another trial. In the first throw, 11 decayed. And you can see the, the difference. There's a big, big difference between the two values. That's just the random nature of um, decay. Now to get the number remaining, um, we had 72 to start with and then 17 decayed in the first trial, so that left 55. So I've just subtracted that 17 from the 72 and left with 55. Then another 7 decayed, and that left me with 48, and so on all the way down. We did that for a second lot of trials, and then I've just averaged the two. Now the first thing we can do is plot the number of the throw against the number of um, dice or atoms that are remaining. So let's have a look and see what we get. I'll select the throw column and the number remaining column and just insert a scatter plot. And you can see it looks very much like exponential decay. It's a nice smooth curve. Now let's have a look at the trend line. So it won't be linear, it'll be an exponential. So I'll put an exponential trend line through that. And see, that seems to fit fairly well. So let's have a look at um, putting some, get rid of that one. Let's have a look at putting Now in this section of the video, I'm going to have a look at plotting some of that data from the dice throw from before. Now I've redone the dice throw, and this time I've done 19 throws rather than the five or six we had in the first part. Now you can see there's, at the beginning we start with the first throw and I've lost 17 dice for trial one. Uh, for the first throw for trial two, I've lost 11 dice and so on. The second throw, lost another seven and so on all the way down. And then here's trial two all the way down for 19 throws. Now to get the number remaining, this column here, 
all I've done is I started with 72, and that's that one. I lost 17, so take that away and you get 55. And in the next throw, I lost seven more, so that takes it down to 48, and so on down that column. I did the same for the second lot of trials. Now I've just averaged them in this column here. Now if I plot the number of throw versus the number remaining, we should get a nice exponential graph. Let's have a look. So I'll insert a scatter plot. That looks pretty ex pretty uh, much like an exponential graph. Um, I'll now add a trend line. Now we'll try an exponential trend line. Should fit nicely. And we'll add some exponential don't forget we'll add the equation and the r squared value i'll bring them up here to have a look i'll just make them a bit bigger so you can see them take them up to 12 point now what you'll notice is that the equation for the line is exponential decay it's decay because there's a little negative sign in there so it's saying y which is the number remaining is equal to 68.847 times e, it's the um, exponent, to the power of negative 0.155x, and x is the number of the throw. R squared is pretty good, 0.99, so it's indicating that formula is a good fit. This is a simple demonstration about how no, we can model radioactive so decay we using dice. That. So in this case, we we'll start with a pack of 72 dice we can now linearize that and shuffle the them way up you linearize it is in a container. A number of throw along the bottom and then the tip them out now log there are six faces the on the dice so the we're going to choose now, already the one that shows with the upper side with the six numbers. dots you can see in and we'll this say that one LN. has decayed and so, the so natural there should log be of 72 one in six should decay now if you've got 72 yeah. dice that's so about 12 should decay the number so in this case code. here you can see the students have taken out natural log all the ones with the six facing upwards and that comes and to with a bit of luck we should get about a, um, a line 14 a, uh, so they've they've pulled out 14 dice that have lines. decayed have that leaves 58 behind so they're going to do it again that looks pretty linear this time me. it should be one sixth so of the 58 next thing we should do about nine or so is add the trend line and you can see them counting them out it's here now this is the six linear. uppermost so they've decayed we'll put that through and more options we'll have a look at it looks like they're going to get about eight or nine equation and the r squared yes they've got nine higher. there so they'll repeat that that leaves point again. 49 dice to put back in the it. container now, they'll shuffle that up the and continue on the gradient is negative no, it just happens they'll keep doing this point one or at least a half eight, a dozen throws which is the same as the we'll exponent um, back up here and see the, what they get uh, for this one graph. looks okay, like so it should be add a couple of things here about I'll 80 the dice yes they've got number. eight so that leaves 41 oh. behind okay so for the next um, next throw I'll, put I'll just keep on going ln now I'll just take a shortcut a here the number and we'll go to this the end part the where they're um, down LN to just a few dice versus so it was T the number of the they've throw. recorded all the data that's all now, pretty good. now record it now the next thing to do is to have a look at the uh, maximum minimum so what we have to do is or maximum minimum gradient what we really need to do is put uncertainty or error bars on this uh, linear trend line now i've calculated the uncertainty in the log already um, you can see it here the uncertainty in the log look I'll, I'll just show you the equation it's the absolute value of the log of d3 which is the first trial minus the log of e3 which is the second trial so i've subtracted those two and divided by two that's just max minus min on two and i've taken the absolute value of that Okay, so that's come to zero. The next one, you, know, you can see it's 0.05 and so on. 
So let's add some error bars to this second one down here. So I'll add error bars here. And I'm going to go for more options. Now I don't want the um, I don't want the horizontal error bars, I want the vertical ones. So I can delete the horizontal and now I can add the, the right error bars that I want, which will be these here on custom. And I'm now going to specify a value. Now the value will be for the positive error will be this range from there to there. And for underneath, it'll be the same. So it's above and below the line by the same amount. Now you can see I've got the error bars on there. Now most of the error bars don't show up. They're under the dots, so you can't really tell. But notice down the end here, when we're getting down to just a few dice remaining, the error is quite significant. Okay, so what I now want to do is work out the maximum and minimum. So what I need to do is draw lines um, of best fit that are for the maximum gradient and minimum gradient. So the simplest way is just to insert. So I'll go to insert illustrations, shapes, and I'll choose line. Now I'm going to draw a line that goes from there at the top down to the bottom, but it has to be within the error bars. Now this will have the minimum gradient, so it's about there. So I can leave that there, and I'll just make that darker, and I'll repeat that for um, a second line from the same sort of point, but it'll go down to about there. So that's the maximum gradient, something like that. Now you can do it better than that, but you can see what I'm getting at. I'll colour that in. So the next thing to do is to work out the gradients of those two lines. The, the black line is the minimum gradient, and the orange line is the maximum gradient. Now this takes a while to do, so what I've done is prepared this before, and I'll just change sheets to show you where it's done. Okay, so I've done it before, and you can see it's here. Now, over here I've written what I've um, already calculated. So, step one is the linear trend line gradient. Now, we know the trend line gradient is negative 0.1548. So, I've got that written here. Now, the maximum gradient is just the change in y divided by the change in x. Now, the change in y is from about 4.3 down to about... Uh, 1.2, this is for the maximum gradient. So 1.2 minus 4.3 over 19 comes to 0.16316. Now it would be negative, but we're just talking about the gradient. And then for the minimum gradient, I've done the same sort of thing. It's um, 4.3 down to 1.5, which is that thing, uh, that point there, divided again by 19 and we get 0.14737. So that's the maximum minimum gradients. Now the next thing, step four, is to work out the absolute uncertainty in the gradient. So that's max minus min on two. So it's maximum, which is there, minus the minimum, which is the next one, divided by two. That comes out to plus or minus 0 0.007895. Now it doesn't really matter how many um, decimal places you put in here, you worry about significant figures at the end. Now to calculate the percentage uncertainty rather than just the absolute, step five is I take the absolute uncertainty, which is the 0 0.007895, and divide by the um, average value or the trend line value, which back here was 0 0.1548, and then multiply by 100, and I get about 5.1%. So the uncertainty is about 5%, which is fairly typical of senior physics um, or physics experiments. Now, to work out the half-life, um, you'll see from the formulas, it's 0.693, which is just the log of 2, natural log of 2, um, 
divided by the gradient, so it's 4.47 minutes that works out to. Now, remembering, of course, we've got an, an absolute a percentage uncertainty of 5.1%. So we can then calculate the half-life, this is step seven, as being 4.47 minutes, or throws, we're calling it minutes to make it more like a lifetime, um, plus or minus 0 0.051 or 0 0.051 minutes. That's just the 5.1% of the 4.47 minutes. Um, and that gives us a range in step eight of 4.42 minutes to 4.52 minutes. Okay, that's just subtracting and adding that 0 0.051 minutes to the uh, middle value or the trend line value. Now, if you look at that, the experimental range I've said here does, that should be does, D-O-S, O-E-S, does not um, include the accepted value of 4.15 minutes, okay, because here's the accepted half-life I've written here, 4.15 throws. Now, that's worked out from um, the statistics of uh, the uh, the probability of getting um, the number of number six in each throw, so it can be worked out that it should be about a half life of four point one five throws, um, and the value we got was four point four two to four point five two. So that doesn't include the accepted value, so we can't really consider the experiment accurate. So let's have a look at this again. Four point one five throws, go back to this graph, is around about there somewhere, and you can see that's about half of the 72 dice that we started with, down to about 36 dice. Goes across and it's about just over four throws or four minutes. So to sum up, it's not that accurate, it was fairly close. We can finally work out the absolute error, step 10. It's just the absolute value of the um, 4.47 minus the 4.15, which is the accepted value. So our experimental value minus the accepted value comes to 0 0.32 minutes. That's the absolute error. We calculate in step 11, the percentage error is just the 0 0.32 divided by the accepted value times 100, and that's about 7.7% error. Now, that's not too bad for that sort of experiment.